Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing purine synthesis. Now, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and we really appreciate it. So with that being said, let's discuss DNA really quickly. DNA is our genetic code and it's located in the nucleus of eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, you know it's located in the cytoplasm. Now, DNA itself is a polymer of nucleotides and within these nucleotides, you have two main classes. You have the pyrimidines and the purines, which we're going to be discussing today. These are your purines nucleotides right here adenine and guanine now when it comes to uh, nucleotides they can be used as a source of energy as well as physiologic mediators both pyrimidines and purines can do that but it's more commonly associated with purines for example you have cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP which are physiologic mediators you also have ATP which is adenosine triphosphate okay now purine synthesis is very important because this is number one a source of confusion for a lot of people this is very difficult but number two it's also important because there are many diseases and many medications that you need to know when it comes to purine synthesis that are very high yield when it comes to sources you can derive purines not only from your diet but there are two main mechanisms two main pathways the first one is the direct synthesis pathway which we're discussing today then you also have the salvage pathways in which you can salvage salvage purines from the uh, the remnants or DNA breakage or uh, the breakdown products of DNA. Essentially, there are different pathways for purines and pyrimidines. We're going to be discussing pyrimidine synthesis in a uh, upcoming lecture, but for now, keep in mind that there are different pathways, but they do have similar substrates that they both share, and there are similarities between the two. And then the other thing to remember is that DNA is always synthesized first, and then it's going to be converted into, uh, sorry, RNA is always synthesized first, and then it's going to be converted converted into DNA and uh, we're going to now talk about the synthesis itself. All of the nitrogen when it comes to purines are going to be derived from amino acids and as you can see there are three main amino acids in purine synthesis that you need to be aware of. The first one is aspartate, the second one is glutamine, and then you have glycine. All of this is very high yield because you need to understand these three amino acids are very important because without them, you're not going to be able to synthesize purine. Keep in mind, this nitrogen and then these nitrogens right here and this nitrogen are all derived from different uh, amino acids. This nitrogen comes from aspartate. This one right here, the seventh nitrogen at the seventh position comes from glycine. And then position two and nine come from glutamine. So if you have a deficiency in aspartate, if you have a deficiency in glycine or glutamine, you're not going to be able to synthesize purines. Now, the carbons actually come from various sources. There are two main sources you need to be aware of. Number one, you have carbon dioxide, which makes sense, right? Carbon dioxide from respiratory CO2. And then you have a very high yield uh, substrate called tetrahydrofolate. We are going to have our own, a whole lecture dedicated to folate and tetrahydrofolate and folate synthesis. But keep in mind that folate is very important because it allows us to create tetrahydrofolate. And that's where these, uh, uh, carbon, uh, um, these carbon structures are coming from, essentially. Now, when it comes to purine synthesis, you need to remember that the goal, the end goal is going to be creating AMP or GMP, adenosine monophosphate or guanine monophosphate. It's all going to start with ribose 5-phosphate, R5P, okay? This is a very important substrate. This is a sugar uh, molecule you need to know, which comes from the HMP shot. From there, this, the first step is going to be creating PRPP, and then the second step is going to be creating IMP. That's mainly what you need to remember. Keep in mind, we're going to make this into a very simplified, very easy way to remember something you can just, you know, uh, refer to really quickly when you're taking exams or being tested on these concepts. So you don't need to know all the nitty gritty details. You need to know the very high yield content. That's what we're focusing on today. The rate limiting enzyme is going to be glutamine PRPP ami amidotransferase. OK, and this is what the overview looks like. Ribose 5-phosphate is going to get converted number one in the first step into PRPP. PP, and then it's going to be converted into IMP. And from there, you can then convert IMP into AMP or GMP. This is the more detailed version that you need to know, okay? 
from the previous uh, slide, this one becomes a little bit more detailed, but not so much, okay? Ribose 5-phosphate is going to become PRPP, which is going to be converted into IMP, which can get further converted into AMP and GMP. Now, at this position where PRP is being converted into IMP is where you're going to see all the addition of the amino acids that we were discussing originally, and then the carbon, uh, uh, carbon precursors where the carbon molecules are coming from for purine synthesis. This is where they're going to get added, and they're going to get added by a molecule, by an enzyme called glutamine PRPP aminotransferase. Remember, this is the this right here is the rate limiting step, okay? The uh, glutamine PRPP aminotransferase, which is going to convert PRPP essentially into IMP with the addition of all of these molecules right here. Once this happens, you're going to get IMP. IMP can then become AMP and GMP. Keep in mind that these three molecules right here, IMP, AMP, and GMP, can actually also have a negative feedback on glutamine, PRPP, aminotransferase, and then it's going to cause a decrease in synthesis of IMP. Because if you have a buildup of IMP, you're going to end up building up AMP and uh, GMP. And sometimes you don't want that because, like we said earlier, these are also physiologic uh, uh, mediators, right? And if you have a buildup of these precursor molecules, you might be able to build up cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP and that's going to cause other physiologic effects that might be you know uh, not good for the body that your body doesn't want happening so once you have adequate amounts IMP AMP and GMP will have a negative feedback and it's going to cause a down regulation of glutamine PRPP aminotransferase so you don't have excessive production of uh, IMP and the, subs the subsequent uh, substrates being formed Amino, uh, sorry, purine synthesis is also important because after you create AMP, you're then going to create ATP and GTP, right? That's what's going to end up happening. And all of this essentially is going to be important in RNA synthesis because these are mainly used in RNA synthesis. When you have ATP and GTP formed, then you're going to de you're going to take away the oxygen, uh, the, uh, sorry, the OH substrate, and you're going to have deoxy or DATP and DGTP. These are the molecules that are used in DNA synthesis and this step right here is uh, very important because it utilizes the enzyme ribonucleotide reductase. And the clinical context for all this essentially comes into play when we're talking about medications. Medications are very important because a lot of times uh, purine and pyrimidine synthesis are targets for medications to prevent certain types of pathologic conditions. For example, we have the drug ribavirin. Ribavirin is an antiviral drug that's given for specifically, usually for RSV. That's a, a very high yield association. It's given for R RSV uh, infections in neonates and and newborns. You also have the drug mycophenolate. This is an, am an aminosuppressant medication that's often given for people who might be going through uh, uh, transplants. Both of these drugs function very similar in the fact that they block IMP dehydrogenase. That is their main function. This is going to blunt the conversion of IMP into GMP. And that's going to inhibit essentially guanine nucleotide synthesis. And you're not going to be able to create guanine nucleotides. That's very important because these two drugs are often highly tested. You need to know how they're functioning. And you need to remember that these two drugs affect purine synthesis that is what they're affecting they are preventing purines from being formed now with that being said that's going to be the basis of our purine synthesis lecture keep in mind we made this very simple we, we made this very easy so you can watch this video and really quickly know what's happening we're not diving too deep into the pathways we're not diving too deep into where everything comes from the, the main things you need to just remember is that when it comes to purine synthesis the first step is going to be to oh sorry when it comes to purine synthesis you first need to remember you're going to start with ribose 5-phosphate the first step is going to be to create PRPP. The second step is going to be creating IMP. And from there, you can create AMP and you can create GMP. This is a rate limiting step, okay, which uh, involves glutamine, PRPP, aminotransferase. And you need the enzymes aspartate, glutamine, glycine, 
for the nitrogen components of purine and tetrahydrofolate and carbon dioxide for the carbon components of purines. And with that being said, that's pretty much everything you need to know for our basis, for our uh, purine synthesis lecture, the basics of it. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll see you back here real soon.